All right, good morning, everybody. The clock has struck 11.02, so we're going to dive right on in. Uh, we have a lot of announcements. You may have noticed, I, I'd strongly recommend, and I, I'm not going to say it's mandatory, but I strongly recommend to the point of almost mandatory, if you did not grab a bulletin, uh, to grab a bulletin. Um, you may also notice that it's about the size of a college paper. Uh, it's because there is a lot of announcements in there. Uh, so make sure that, uh, because I'm not going through all of them, that you grab one of those uh, real quick. If you want to go do it now, go for it as people are still uh, filing in. Uh, but first off, if you are a guest, well, first off, happy uh, Labor Day. And also, if you are a guest, we're so happy that you've joined us this morning. Uh, please let us know that you're here by filling out a Connect card. And uh, those are on the table in the back. Or you can do a uh, mobile version by scanning the QR code uh, on the bulletin that you just picked up. And so let us know that you're here and also grab a gift bag on your way out the door today. Uh, we Again, we want to thank you for all of your support and your tithes and your offerings and also your prayers. Uh, one of the new things that we have brought uh, onto the back of the bulletin is a QR code uh, that will take you straight to the offering uh, part of our website or offering site. So uh, if you would like to give in that way, that is an option, or you can still continue to uh, put it in the box before you, before service begins, or you can do it by um, giving online through our website. Uh, speaking of giving, the month of September is our Alma Hunt offering for Virginia Missions. And so our goal is 1200 and this offering goes towards um, uh, impact. It also goes to BGAV and other uh, ministries that are associated with our association. Children's Church is looking for three volunteers, and this is a really important thing. Uh, we need three volunteers who are able to help out one Sunday a month uh, because right now we do not have enough volunteers who are able to uh, do so. So uh, at this point, uh, I think September's fine, but if we can't have three people come to help, we will only be able to have Children's Church, uh, which is happening after worship and you know, during 11 o'clock for uh, the first and third Sundays. So uh, we want to be able to keep that going. So if we have people come and ask what to do with their kids, we will be able to say we always have something to do uh, with your kids. So like I said, uh, with lunch buddies, I know I'm not great at math, but I know there's at least three of you in here. So you're already here during the 11 o'clock service anyway. So think about that and please let me or Laura or Becky Allman know as soon as possible. Uh, also, if you have any new information for the church directory, uh, now is a really good time to uh, send that in. Uh, please do that by September 17th. If you have any new pictures or updated pictures that you would like uh, to be in on the uh, church directory, uh, email those to Debbie, or you can bring her even a flash drive or something. But, um, you know, please get those in by September 17th. Uh, the care ministry is also looking for some help. Uh, so next uh, Sunday, there will be in the education room two and four, or the old Fishers of Men classroom, which Wayne will explain a little more later, an interest meeting on how we can uh, get involved and help that ministry. Uh, this is a ministry that helps uh, with meals during funeral services, and that sort of thing. So if you're interested in that or want in more information, uh, please let Lynn Paquette know. And that is right after second service next Sunday. Mets, don't forget that you're meeting Thursday, September 14th. And if you are uh, hoping to come to that, please RSVP either here in the CLC or on the website or call the office by uh, Sunday, September 10th. There's also a, a mandatory uh, training and thank you luncheon for all nursery and preschool volunteers Sunday, September 24th. Uh, so if you are a nursery or preschool volunteer and you are not able to make that meeting, please uh, let Jesse know as soon as possible. And there's information on how to do that in the bulletin as well. Sunday, October 1st, we're having a baptism service. So if you are interested in being baptized, uh, please talk to either me or Pastor Wayne by September 24th. And then finally, don't forget that our, on October 1st is our sanctuary rededication uh, Sunday celebration. It'll be not down here, it's going to be up in the sanctuary, because it'd be kind of weird to have it down here. Uh, it'll be up in the sanctuary, uh, so at 1030, it'll be a combined worship service, and there will be lunch down here in the CLC right afterwards. So if you are uh, excited, and I think most of us are, uh, do your best to try to pack that sanctuary in to where, you know, we got to start, like, streaming it into, like, other parts of the building. And uh, they can come in later and see it. So, uh, like again, like I said, check out the bulletin. It's the about the size of what I'm assuming my doctoral thesis is going to look like. It's a big one, so uh, make sure you uh, check that out to see what's going on. 
Other than that, let's uh, dive on in and we're going to worship together. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion. By His blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, His life is destiny. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King. Good morning. I welcome you also to Olive Branch Baptist Church this morning. And we've just sung a song about what we believe. And we are believers in Jesus Christ. And 
pray and worship the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is why we are here this morning and you're with your brothers and sisters. So welcome them this morning to Olive Branch by a handshake, a hug, a greeting. The scripture I wanted to read to you today is Psalm 121. It's a song of ascents. As I've told you before, these are uh, a few psalms in the middle of this book of psalms that tell us that uh, the Israelites sang as they were going to worship at the temple. And so as they would go and as they got closer, they would sing another song. And this is one of them. And it's a song that teaches us that God is always watching over us, always protecting us. And that is so important to know, especially as we live life and as our life at times feel as though we're all alone. But we never are. And so let's listen to these encouraging words from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter at your right side. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This time, Keith, would you come please and pray for our service as Keith is coming I want to tell you that so many times we trust and call out to people and things before we call out to God. When do we need help? Whenever we need it. Why don't we call out to God first rather than going every place else? Keith, would you pray for us this morning? Good morning, everybody. Wow, here it is, Labor Day weekend. Tomorrow's Labor Day. If you're like me, you're probably asking, where did the summer go to? It only seems like yesterday I was putting away the Christmas decorations. Had breakfast the other day at Cracker Barrel, and Christmas, according to them, is is around the corner, three months away, so you can get your Christmas shopping done early. But Labor Day is a unique holiday. If you think back before we had a Labor Day holiday, back 139 years ago, we didn't have any child's labor laws, We didn't have any type of safety laws, OSHA, or any other government agencies protecting the worker. It wasn't until Governor, uh, Governor, President Cleveland, 139 years ago, signed in the first labor laws, because at that time, the typical work day was 16 to 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week. And if you're late, or you complain, didn't show up, you're out of work, because there are probably 10 or more people waiting to take your job. So because of that, we now celebrate the over 157 million workers United States uh, who contribute to our well-being from the truck drivers to the doctors to the nuclear engineers and stuff and all the other people that make our our lives um, able to do what we we do. But Labor Day is a time of change. It marks the end and the beginning. We start the new school year. A lot of kids started college just a few weeks ago and also we start the new church year. And some of the men folks, and of course some of the ladies too, it's also the start of the football season. Condolences to the UVA fans yesterday and their loss to Tennessee, but congratulations to the Hokie fans and their triumph revenge on ODU uh, over last year's massacre by, by them. But one of the things I reflect back as I get older, I guess my body is trying to tell my mind you can't do what you want to do, but I reflect when I was a youth and a holiday, special Labor Day, we would gather at my great grandmother's house. And of course, there was no air conditioning back then. And our fun was uh, getting a gar- in the garden and getting a, a watermelon or two and cutting it up and sitting on the porch and reminiscing and listening to all the old folks. And I didn't realize I'd be old now as I reminisce, but uh, talking about tales and stuff. But we always had s- a seed spitting contest who could spit the watermelon seed the farthest? So this weekend, luckily having all my grandkids with us, and we had a watermelon, and much to my amaze, there are no seeds and watermelons you get today. So, uh, so much for that thing. But uh, 
being changes being made, just wish we could slow down a little bit and turn back the time and clock and just remember we don't have to be as busy trying to fill our days up with things to do and stuff. It's time to re reflect on what the Lord has done for us. And I make this request to urgency because I lost two close friends this summer took traffic accidents. I know the, the ladies went down every year to the Outer Banks for the annual Women's Weekend get-together. And they had no idea that they'd be meeting the Lord that weekend. I know their hearts and their souls were committed to Jesus Christ. But for those who are thinking or have not or want to renew, uh, please contact one of the pastors, Wayne or Brad, or even one of the new deacons or some of the old deacons to, to renew and stretch out and ask for God's love and forgiveness and acceptance of Jesus Christ. As John said, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the everlasting life. So keep that in mind, and please bow our heads. Dear Lord, we come before you today humbling ourselves, begging for your mercy, for your continuous guidance, forgiveness, and direction as we prepare for the new year. And be with us as we go and work this week or visit our friends and new friends and contribute to the love of your son, Jesus Christ. So thank you for not only our friends, our church friends, our church family, but thanks for their house. Thanks for the food on the table. Thanks for all the gifts that you bestowed upon us. And most importantly, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Keith. All right, let's can stand up and let's continue to worship together. promise to God each day though some may oppose me I won't be ashamed whatever I face Lord it won't be in vain I will trust in Christ every step I take for all of my days I will live for your glory running with courage and faith the prize of my journey Set on heaven where treasure awaits I'll run with endurance to finish the race I will trust in Christ every step I take For all of my days I will live for your glory Running with courage and faith The prize of my journey For all of my days I will live for 
year, months ago, something like that. When you have a child that never sleeps, all time just kind of blends together. Um, I introduced you guys to a band called Ghost Ship, who, uh, look what God has done, is one that we do pretty frequently, at least me and Will. And so they have more than one song out there, and so this is the other one uh, that uh, I've been wanting to do for a while, and uh, finally found the chords in the right key to do it. So we'll try it out. It's a pretty simple song. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat, and children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. Well, this morning we're in Romans chapter 15 and 16, if you want to turn there. But as you are waiting to turn there, I want to talk to you about Sunday school. Now, many of you rushed down here from Sunday school today, 
But I know some of you aren't in a Sunday school class, and so that's why I wanted to talk about it today, because now is the perfect time to start, because we've just begun a new church year, and some of our classes are starting a new topic. So uh, we've also changed some classrooms and changed some names. So it'll be confusing to those who've been going to Sunday school for a lot of years, so that's why I want to explain it as Well, and what I'm going to explain are the Sunday school classes for adults. We do have Sunday school from nursery all the way up to as old as you are. And so there are classes for all ages. But the ones I want to share with you are the adult classes. And the uh, first one is the Fishers of Men class. They meet in the fellowship hall. And they've been studying 1 Corinthians and they'll go into 2 Corinthians. And they've been doing that for a while. And of course, as you go up to uh, where the sanctuary and the education wing is, this is the fellowship hall. So from the cemetery, it's all the way to the left, uh, to the right as you're in the cemetery looking up the hill. And so all the way to the right, you can start there. Fisher's a main class. That's for married couples. It's for singles. It's for old people, young people. It's just a class for anyone who wants to come. And then as you go into behind the sanctuary into the education wing, that's where all the rest of the classes are. And the first one you come to is the woman-to-woman class. They used to meet in the annex. It was our nice way of saying the trailer because we don't like to use that word, okay? So the, the trailer that's out there currently does not have a Sunday school class because the woman-to-woman class has moved to the education wing. And so if you're walking down the education wing, they're the first class on the left, and they are meeting in the room that used to be where the Fishers of Men met before they went to the fellowship hall, Okay. So you often hear us say, we're going to meet in the Fishers of Men's classroom. Well, we're not going to do that anymore because that's the fellowship hall. Okay, so now it's going to be uh, the woman-to-woman class, formerly known as the Fishers of Men class, for a little while longer, so not to confuse everybody, but then we'll probably drop the formerly as pretty soon, okay? And they're going to study the Gospel of Mark, and that began this morning. And then if you go uh, down on the right-hand side, there's some children's classrooms, but all the way, almost all the way down on the right is the joy class. And also they're studying the Gospel of Mark, and they meet in that room in uh, uh, room 7 and 9. And this class, again, is for anyone who wants to attend. Of course, the woman-to-woman class is for women, and this is for anyone who wants to attend. Right across the hall is the man-to-man class, which is for men, of course. And they're studying uh, a book called The Three Mile Walk. And it is the story of Jonathan in the Old Testament as he showed bravery and courage as he went and fought the Philistines, but also has lessons for our life, especially for us as men. And that meets in room 10. And then all the way at the end of the hall on the right as you're going down is what used to be called the Basement Believers. But that class hasn't met in the basement of the church for months. And so they've changed their name to Truth Seekers. And they are studying the life of David. And that is primarily couples that are younger or middle-aged. I like to keep thinking I'm younger, but I'm middle-aged getting too elderly here. So, you know, you just get older and older. But anyway, that's that room at the, all the way at the end. So you can start the fellowship hall and you can walk all the way down and find adult classrooms. If you want to start one Sunday there and make your way down, or if you want to choose one based on the topic or based on whether you're a man or a woman or married or whatever, or maybe you just want to walk down, try them all out. Who's got the, the biggest class, the smallest class, the best looking people in the class, the smartest people in the class? I don't know. You just walk down and, and try them. But I wanted to let you know about them because we've changed the name of basement believers to truth seekers. The women to women are not in the annex. They're in the Fishers of Men class. The Fishers of Men are not in the Fishers of Men class. They're in the fellowship hall and everything in between. Everybody got that straight? It's clear as mud. But the most important thing is Sunday school is a place where you gather together and you study the Word of God deeper than we can in a sermon. And you can discuss and talk back and forth, which we don't typically do in a sermon, although it's not a bad idea. And even more than that, you get to know people that you can't really get to know uh, just coming to a service. Because in a service, most of the time we're looking this way, and maybe you may say something to someone as you go that way. But, you know, a lot of times if you don't stay afterwards, you never get to know anybody just in a service. In Sunday school, you can. So that's why it's vitally important and a big part of Olive Branch. And you all are encouraged to attend a class this fall. So... Let me pray for us, and then we'll come to the the end of the book of Romans. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you are a God who reigns. 
There's nothing that we face in life that surprises you. There's nothing that happens in life that's out of your control and is chaos and random. Every detail of our life you know about, you're in control of it, and you use it. Even the tragedies, even our own sin. These things, Lord, you don't do. You don't commit our sin. You don't orchestrate the tragedies. But you're in control of them, and you use them to bring about good in our life and to bring about your perfect plan and your pleasing will. So, Father, I'm thankful we were able to sing with confidence that you reign. And as we ask the questions of whether we are in situations in life where we feel hopeless and helpless, you are there and you are in control. I'm thankful, Lord, that we are now able to come to your word and able to not only hear the Apostle Paul's plans for his life, but also learn, Lord, how we are to serve you and your kingdom. So teach us now. May we listen and may we hear and obey. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, you all know this man, Billy Graham, even though some of you uh, have never heard him speak in person. In fact, the number of people who have actually heard him in person are getting less and less and less since he passed years ago. And his ministry began in the 40s. And so a, a, a lifetime, a legacy of preaching the gospel and the gospel all over the world. And if you counted the people who saw his messages on television, heard him on radio, you probably could count in the billions the people who heard Billy Graham. A name that, as I said, any American evangelical would know and recognize his picture. We'll talk more about him in a moment. Now, this picture, you don't recognize the picture because no one knows what the Apostle Paul looked like, okay? So, but you know the name Paul when we refer to a man in the New Testament. Of course, he's the one who wrote the letter of Romans as he was introducing himself to the Romans because he had a desire to go and visit them. And so he was going to go visit them and he said, this is the gospel that I preach. And that's what we've been studying for weeks, this gospel, this good news. And now as he's concluding his letter, he's saying basically to the Romans, he's saying, hi, I'm going to see you soon. And as he finishes his letter, he's telling them what his plans are. And so let's talk about Paul. The time he wrote this letter, his past as a Christian was about 23 years. If you know anything about his story, he had been trained by the best Jewish scholars. He was a Jew who at first was zealous in persecuting Christians. He saw Christianity as... A, um, something other than Judaism. I was trying to say where it slipped my mind. That's okay, <laughs> right? He saw it against Judaism. He saw Christians as the enemy. He had them arrested. He had them had, handed over to be persecuted. That was Paul's life until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was going to Damascus to arrest some more Christians. And there God came to him. Jesus came to him. And Paul was saved, and his life turned around completely. A whole 180, he was persecuting Christians and then became someone who convinced people to become Christians. And so from that moment, and for 23 years, he preached the gospel about Jesus Christ, primarily to the Gentiles, but usually when he would go to a town, he would find the Jewish synagogue because he was a Jew, and he would go there, and he would worship there, and he would tell them about Jesus. And then he would go into the marketplaces and to the town, and he would go and tell Gentiles about Jesus. And this was the life of Paul for 23 years, up to the moment he's writing this letter to the Romans. In fact, he says it this way, For I would not dare say anything except what Christ has accomplished through me by word and deed for the obedience of the Gentiles, by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, and by the power of God's Spirit, 
As a result, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way around to Elycrium. So Paul tells us this, that his main aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named so that I will not build on someone else's foundation. And that has been his strategy, to go from town to town, but to go where there are no Christians. Today we have people who do the same thing. We use the term sometimes pioneer missionary because they're going to a place where either there are no Christians or sometimes even to a place that's never even heard of Jesus. You know, some places where there's no Christians, they've heard of Jesus, but they've rejected him. But other places, still today, it's hard to believe there are people groups, if you say the name Jesus, they have no idea what you're talking about. They've never seen a Bible. They've never seen a Christian. That's hard to believe, but you know that's, that's becoming more and more the case here in America. So it's not so hard to imagine. And so there are missionaries today that do the same thing. And I want you to imagine how difficult that is. Could you imagine just your life now, take a moment and think today, you sit in your house and none of your neighbors are Christians, none of your co-workers are Christians, nobody around you other than your family who came with you knows anything about Jesus. Think about the sacrifice that would be, think about how difficult that would be to live in that culture and think about how difficult it would be to go and share with them the gospel. It would take a lot of work just to build some something in common, and find an opportunity to share. Some places our pioneer missionaries go, as I said, they know who Jesus is. They said, we don't want Jesus here. And so not only is it a place of no believers, it's a place of hostility and is dangerous for Christians to be. So this is a life of people today. I don't think we pray enough for them, don't uh, think about them enough, because we have so many Christians around us. That was Paul's life. And he also had a particular strategy of not going to places where there were already Christians. Because there were other ministers for them. And so he said he did this from Jerusalem, which is the triangle, to here on this map it says Illyria, but Illyrium is the same name, a different name for the same place. It's about 1,400 miles apart. So maybe if he was in the U.S., he could say, I preached the gospel from New York City to Denver, Colorado. I guess that's about halfway across the U.S., thereabouts. So quite a, a long plate, I mean, quite a long journey. It was three different missionary journey, journeys over this distance. He would go, he would come back, he would go and encourage, he would write letters to the churches. He had been doing this. But now as he's writing, he's ready to start something different, something new in his life. So when he writes, it's A.D. 57, and he says this about what's going on in his life at the time he writes to the Romans. Right now, I'm traveling to Jerusalem to serve the saints because Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased and indeed are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual benefits, then they are obligated to minister to them in material needs. So Paul was in Corinth as he was writing this, which is modern-day Greece. And so that's why I have this picture. Uh, Corinth isn't on this map, but Athens is, so they're close to each other. Okay, So that's why I've circled Athens for you. And his plan now is to go to Jerusalem, the Triangle. And when he goes there, he has collected an offering as he has been in Corinth and as he's been in the area from churches who were Gentile believers. And since the gospel had originated with Jesus, who was a Jew, and was first to the Jews, and now the Jews were in need and were poor and were hungry and needed help, Paul said it was right that the Gentiles, who now were being blessed by the gospel and blessed with the money they had, that they help out their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who were in need. So it's a very practical thing. Paul has collected an offering. He's planning to travel to Jerusalem. And he's telling the Romans this because his future plan is then to go visit them after he's been to Jerusalem. Of course, Paul didn't know he only had 11 years to live when he wrote this letter. But of course, now we, much 
longer from his day know that he died in AD 68. He had 11 years, but notice what his plans were for the future. That is why I have been prevented many times from coming to you. What had prevented Paul from coming to the Romans was his strategy of only going to places where there were no Christians. So he had avoided Romans in a, Rome in a sense because there were plenty of Christians there. That wasn't his strategy. But he says, now I no longer have any work to do in these regions. And I have strongly desired for many years to come to you whenever I travel to Spain. For I hope to see you when I pass through and to be assisted by you for my journey there once I first enjoyed your company for a while. Later on, he says, so when I have finished this and safely delivered the funds to them, again, that's that offering in Jerusalem, I will visit you on the way to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. And so you notice it's a little bit more than halfway, but it's the capital of the Roman Empire. Paul wants to drop off this offering, minister to the Jews in Jerusalem, and then travel to Rome, see the Romans. That's why he's writing this letter in the first place. And then travel on to Spain. Share the gospel there. But Paul also realized that these were his plans. And God may have had different plans. And in fact, he asked for prayer because he realizes this. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in prayers to God on my behalf. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, and that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed together with you. So his prayer was threefold. He wanted to be rescued from the unbelievers. He wanted to have an acceptable ministry in Jerusalem. And that if the Lord willed, he would also then be able to visit the Romans. It wasn't God's will that this plan come to fruition. Because as Paul went to Jerusalem with the offering, there were Jews there that hated him. And they trumped up charges against him and had him arrested. And so there he was in Jerusalem, and then he was in Caesarea. Uh, there were a couple of different Roman governors that he was under. Finally, he said, I just want to go to Caesar. And that was his plea. He said, I'm a Roman citizen. I have the right to go to Rome and to see Caesar and plead my case before him. And that's what Paul did, and he was sent on his way. But there was also a shipwreck and other things along the journey. As you saw on the map, it's not an easy journey from Jerusalem or that part of the world all the way across the sea to Rome. And so he does get to Rome about three years after he writes this letter, but he doesn't come as a missionary. He comes as a prisoner. So if you read the book of Acts, it ends with Paul under house arrest. So he's not in a dungeon. He's in a house. Uh, he's allowed to have visitors. Uh, he has guards that are chained to him so he doesn't escape when those visitors come. But he visits, he writes, he teaches. So he has a ministry while he's there in Rome. Just everyone has to come to him because he doesn't have the freedom to go anywhere but where he's in chains. The book of Acts ends there. So we don't have any detail in the New Testament about what happened afterwards. Did Paul go to Spain? We have some hints about what his ministry was like after because we read the letters that he wrote after and we read how he's still ministering. And we read later when we read the letters to Timothy, when his life ends, that he's imprisoned again. And so it seems as though he was freed. He ministered for a while. He was imprisoned again. And in AD 68, he was beheaded and died. So we don't know exactly the speculation. So we're not going to speculate or try to guess. All right, But I want you to see... A couple of things from his life. One, we see an example for us to follow. Here is a man who sacrificed everything and turned his life completely around so that anyone and everyone could hear the gospel. And I'm always convicted when I think about Paul because so many of us give up nothing so that people can hear the gospel. And so many times we're so focused on ourselves and our own life and we're focused on what we need and we're thankful that we have salvation that we don't consider that right here in our neighborhoods there are people who do not know Jesus. If Paul was willing to travel over 1,400 miles 
and give up family and comfort and be imprisoned and almost killed so that people can hear the gospel? Can't we give up something? Can't we do something so that people can hear the gospel? And then we also see that no matter what plans we make, God ultimately decides how our life will go and how it will end. But Paul was okay with that. Notice he even prayed if it's God's will. And that's what we're encouraged to do, to make plans, acknowledging that if it's God's will, these plans will come about. But what I really want to talk about was not Paul, because I can kind of maybe bored you with a history lesson, a biography. Again, Billy Graham. We all know him. Do you know who this person is? I don't either. I'm sure she's an actress, if that's what you call someone who poses for a photograph. She was probably paid to pose for a photograph, and the photographer said, hey, just pretend like you're praying. She said, okay, they took a picture, and now it's on the Internet, okay? Let's assume for a moment she represents any Christian out of the billion plus that are on this planet. We know Paul, do you know these names? Andronicus and Junia. Paul said this about them. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews and fellow prisoners. They are noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles, and they were also in Christ before me. All of you came in this morning knowing Paul. I don't even remember Andronicus and Junius, even though I've read Romans lots of times, because it's a name and a long list of names, and I just overlook them, ignore them. But they were very important in Paul's ministry and important in the early church. Notice that all the apostles saw them as very beneficial. They'd also been fellow prisoners. They'd faced persecution for spreading the gospel. And they, in fact, had been a Christian longer than Paul himself had been. So very important people who were in Rome. That I assume there were a lot of people that may have known them. But this is my point. We have Billy Graham that every Christian in America probably knows. But there are a whole lot more believers in this nation that if you put their picture up on a screen you would not know them from anybody else. That's the same in Paul's day. Everyone knew Paul, but he listed 36 people in Romans 16. Eight were with him there in Corinth where he wrote. 28 were in Rome. 27 were men. Nine were women. Two were household. Three were house churches. There were even unnamed brothers and sisters. We don't know how many that was. And there were two women just mentioned as a mother and a sister among the people that he mentions. And as we read the scripture and we read their names, we just skip over them. We say, eh, let me get to the good stuff. I know when you read the genealogies in scripture, you skip over those. And I don't blame you. I mean, I do the same thing. (laughs) You can't pronounce the names. It's just one name after another name after another name. Now, those genealogies are extremely important in the scripture, although you might not think they are. They show us that Jesus Christ was a real human. He's not a legend. He had a family tree. And that family tree goes all the way back to Abraham. And that's why those genealogies are important. But there's other lists of names in the scripture. I think of Nehemiah. If you read the book of Nehemiah, you get a long list of names. This guy worked on this part of the wall, and these people did this, and these people did this. It's a list of all the names of the people who worked on the wall as Nehemiah was rebuilding them. And as you read it today, you just skip over it. It's just a list of names. We all know Nehemiah. You probably even know a little bit about his story. But who cares about the other people? (laughs) But Nehemiah wouldn't have gotten any work done if it wasn't for all those other people. And I think that's why the scripture has those names. And has these names in Romans. Uh, The ministry isn't only Paul. Paul would not have accomplished what God did through him if it wasn't for everybody else. He named 39 people 
And there were a lot more he could have named. So think about this. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of people that partnered with Paul. And if you think about the people who gave financially to help him, there have been thousands upon thousands. And his ministry would not have happened if it wasn't for them. And nothing has changed. It's the same today. Ministry is not done by a Christian celebrity. Ministry is done by every single Christian and every single Christian working together. Paul says it this way, we are all servants. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. All of us are servants and all of us are co-workers and we're all building the building of God's kingdom or actually the building of the church. We're all doing the same thing for the same purpose, for the same Lord. So in that sense, there's nothing different among us. In American culture, we love celebrity. That's why we have movie stars. That's why we have uh, teen idols. That's why we have rock stars. We idolize people who are famous because they're usually famous for what they can do well. They can act well. They can sing well. Or they're rich and they can do things. And we say, wow. But unfortunately, we do the same thing in the American Christian culture. And so we have celebrity preachers. We have celebrity singers. And so if we have a certain celebrity singer come to town, every Christian in town wants a ticket. And they will even come hundreds of miles and they'll pay hundreds of dollars to hear the celebrity Christian singer. There's a five-year-old girl singing out of tune Jesus loves me on a Sunday morning. Who breaks down the door, travels hundreds of miles to hear that? Nobody. Oh, that's ordinary. Ah, that's insignificant. That's not worth my time. We have celebrity preachers, the same thing. I can name names and you would know them. They're household names in our American culture, American Christian culture. And people watch them and read them and will pay money to hear them. And if we invited one of them to Olive Branch, we might have this whole gym filled. We've got to hear this celebrity. What about preachers that aren't very good in their style or their look or their eloquence? But yet they're preaching the truth. And they have a heart that's right with God. And they're faithful. Do we want to hear them? Nah. Not worth my time. Not worth listening to. I'll pass. And I believe that's wrong. I believe that's a problem with our American Christian culture. We've copied the world and we have Christian celebrities. Paul said, don't have celebrities. The, Cor the Corinthians did. <laughs> Apollos was a celebrity, Paul was a celebrity. And they were fighting about which one was better. Don't we even do that with our music and with our preachers? And Paul said, no, 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 no. There were even some spiritual ones that said, well, I follow Christ. I don't follow these guys, you know. So they even they in their pride were saying, you guys. So Paul says, no. Who is Apollos? Who is Paul? They're nobody. They're just co-workers. They're servants. They're laborers. They're just like you. So why are you putting them up on a pedestal? All of us are servants. All of us for the same Lord, for the same purpose. And God is going to reward each one of us according to what gift he's given us and what we've done. I love this parable in Matthew 20. Jesus talks about a owner of a vineyard. And he goes out to call workers to work in his vineyard. 
That's not any different than it is today. There's often places in our country today, well, not today because it's Sunday, but Tuesday because not tomorrow, it's Labor Day. But on Tuesday, <laughs> there will be laborers gathered in a place and someone will drive up a truck and say, who wants to work? And they'll jump in the truck and they'll go to the field and they'll work. All right, so it's no, the same thing happens today. So in this parable, that's what's happening. The, the owner says to these guys looking for work, Let's say it's 5 o'clock in the morning. Who wants to work? Oh, we do. Okay, come on. I will pay you a day's wage to work for a day for me. All right, sounds good. Let's go. Well, then at 9 o'clock in the morning, he goes and he finds some more guys. And he says, will you come work for me? They say yes. He does the same at noon. He does the same at 3. Even at 5 o'clock, when quitting time is at 6, there's only an hour left. He goes and he finds some more guys. No one's hired you yet? Well, come on. Let's go work. They say, okay, we'll go work. And then when it's time to pay, because in those days they got paid every day. I don't know if I could have the discipline to get paid every day. You know, it'd all be gone by the next day. So anyway, they got paid at the end of the day. So the owner said, well, pay them from the ones who came first. I mean, excuse me, they came last and pay the ones who came first last. So the guys that came and worked for an hour, they get a full day's wage. The ones that came at three got a full day's wage. The ones that came at noon got a full day's wage. The ones that came at nine got a full day's wage. So when the ones that came at five o'clock in the morning were getting ready to get their pay, they thought, wow, we're going to get two, three, four, five, six days worth of pay because we've worked a lot longer than these guys and they got a full day's pay. Now, how would you feel? Well, like they did, they complained and <laughs> they said, hey, wait a minute, that's not fair. And the owner said, well, wait a minute. What's not fair about it? You agreed to work for a day for a day's wage. Did you work a day? Yes. Did you get a day's wage? Yes. So what's unfair about that? Well, the answer is nothing's unfair about that. That was extremely fair. He said, do you have a problem with my generosity? Because see, the owner was also generous. Those other guys that got hired, he never told them how much he was going to pay them. They just agreed to work. And in the end, he was generous to them. In fact, so generous that guys that only worked an hour got a full day's pay. So this is the point of the parable. The point is that God is the one who gives the rewards. He's like the owner of the vineyard. And we're like the workers. So God is the one who decides who is rewarded for what they do for the kingdom of God based on what gift he's given them. But we learn these two things. One, God always is fair when he rewards. And God is also generous. So you can serve God with confidence knowing that you will be rewarded and you'll be rewarded fairly and you will be rewarded generously. You're not going to be cheated you're not going to, someone else isn't going to get something unfairly that you should have gotten. So that gives us a lot of confidence to serve God. But I want you to understand this too, with your gifts and your service. All of us are to serve with the talents and gifts God's given us. We are to do so faithfully because God has promised that he will work through us. Remember, Paul didn't take any of the credit. It wasn't what he did. It's what God did through him. So it's not up to us to save people. God saves people. We just tell them about Jesus. It's not up to us to change someone's life because we can't. Only God can change a life. So we don't have to be burdened about the results. You know, if you went and told the gospel to a thousand people and none of them believed, you wouldn't have to be discouraged. You've been faithful. You have done what God's told you to do. It's God's job to save those people. It's their job to respond to God's grace. So doesn't that take a lot of burden off our ministry? We do it faithfully with what God's given us, and then it's in God's hands. Don't compare yourself to others. Others are more gifted than you. Others are less gifted than you. That's how God does it, because he's the one who's in control. Don't judge what they're already receiving, because even as we minister now, we get rewards and we get blessings. They're not all in heaven. 
So you may look and say, well, gosh, I've worked a lot harder than that one, or I've done things a lot harder than that person's doing, but look at how God's blessing their ministry. Look at how he's blessing them. Don't do that. Because this is also true. We're not going to know how the final judgment comes out until the final judgment. Because you know what? Right before Jesus told that parable, and immediately after he told the parable, he said this. The first will be last, and the last will be first. So you know what I think might happen when we get to heaven? Some of those celebrity singers or preachers or celebrity American Christian culture people, they may end up being last. And you know that woman who served in the nursery for 60 years? Maybe never got to come to a worship service, but faithfully served, sacrificed, cared for children, she might end up first. So don't judge now. God will judge. He will judge fairly. He will judge generously. And all who serve him faithfully will be rewarded. And only then will we know who's first and who's last. And these are the final words of the gospel to the Romans, the letter to the Romans, I should say. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. What a run-on sentence. You get an F in English class. It's a good thing that... That's why I think God doesn't care too much about grammar in English, because uh, that's certainly a run-on sentence. But do you hear, again, he began the letter about the gospel. He wasn't ashamed of it. And now he ends his letter by talking about the gospel. And his prayer is that God would strengthen us. And the last words, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever. Amen. Lord, to you be all glory. To you be... All and everything. For God, you are the all-wise God. You are the God who's in control. I thank you, Lord, for this letter that Paul not only wrote to the Romans, but God, you, the Holy Spirit, you inspired as it was written so that these are words to Christians of all ages. This is your word. This has been breathed from you, God, and these are your words to us. May we not be ashamed of the gospel, May we understand it and believe it and share it. May we live our lives as Paul has taught us and as you command, Lord, in the second part of Romans. And may we today understand that we all have a place to play and a gift to use and a service to do for your kingdom. May we do it faithfully. And may we trust in you, God, that you will reward generously and fairly. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time where we respond. For, Lord, I know you have spoken to each and every one of us. Lord, may we not now think about lunch and think about the plans for the afternoon or look at our watch. Right now, Lord, may we respond to what you've spoken. Whether it's repenting of something, a sin that's in our life, or whether it's saying yes to what you have called us to do, whether it's going to a brother or sister, whether it's praying for someone, Lord, whatever you have called us to do in this moment as you have spoken through your word, may now, Lord, we say yes to you. So, Lord, as we sing, may we obey and say yes. And I pray, Jesus, in your name, amen. Let's stand together, let's sing, but let's also say yes to God and respond to what he's spoken to your heart. I'll be here to pray with you.
pray and then we will be dismissed. Lord, we know that uh, you are reigning over all things. We know that you have uh, given us uh, the gift of eternal life through your son. We know that uh, there is trouble all around us and we know that there is a world that is in desperate need of knowing that there is a God who is there and who loves them. So use us in whatever way you see fit so that we may reach the world, so that we may love our brothers and sisters in the faith. Uh, just as all those who are in Rome uh, did for, for Paul and for those that are around us. May we be a, a brother and a sister to those that are around us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you all. You are dismissed.